On August 4, 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. As a result, the young nation of Canada was automatically at war. Canadian soldiers fought bravely alongside their allies in the trenches of Western Europe against the enemy. At home, Canadian men, women, and children rallied together. For many of these Canadians, the enemy seemed so far away. For others, the enemy posed a threat right at home. While often downplayed in the Canadian narrative, Canadian society was inherently racist leading up to and during the First World War. This racism inevitably led to the internment and ill treatment of thousands of people, severely affecting their physical, social, and mental health. It's very often average Canadians who write to officials to denounce their friends and neighbours as being potential enemies, potential spies, saboteurs. The reality, of course, is that oftentimes when they're writing those letters, they're being influenced by um, long-standing feuds or grievances they may have had with their neighbours and their friends, um, long-standing racial prejudices that caused them to see these people as threats when, in fact, they were simply going about their daily business. Canada's racism was most clearly seen in the late 19th and early 20th century open-door immigration policies of Prime Ministers Sir Wilfrid Laurier and Sir Robert Borden. These policies were implemented to meet the demands for skilled and unskilled agricultural and industrial workers, especially on the railroad. There was a divide between the want for immigrants who were deemed desirable and who would easily assimilate into the existing population on one hand, and the plea for immigrants who would offer cheap labor on the other. An influx of Asian and Eastern European immigrants in the years before 1914 led to explosive cultural and racial overtones within Canadian society. By 1914, racism in Canada had reached a new extreme. Since the country was at war with Germany and Austria-Hungary, residents of German, Austrian, Hungarian, Ukrainian, Romanian, and other Central and Eastern European backgrounds were especially targeted and viewed as enemies and threats to the order and welfare of Canadian society. Foreign appearance or a bad-tempered demeanor were grounds alone for suspicion and arrest. In reality, the threat was more theoretical than real. The only real threat they posed to Canadians was a threat to their Anglo-Saxon Protestant vision of Canada. Those immigrants who threatened this vision were labeled as enemy aliens by the War Measures Act of 1914, and by 1919, 8,579 men, women, and children had been interned in 24 various camps across Canada. It's an important point, which is that that perception of a threat is very different from the reality. And so that uh, average Canadians may have believed those things, but it certainly didn't make them to be true. Even within these camps, racism flourished. There was a clear class, social, and racial distinction within the camps. German internees, who were generally literate and seen as well-cultured, were considered to be unaccustomed to physical work. Although German internees were required to do some physical labor, they enjoyed luxuries such as playing cards, watching and performing shows, and playing sports. Being detained in the urban centers of Amherst, Halifax, Vernon, and Fort Henry, German internees were generally treated fairly according to international military standards. This is partly because many were army officers or merchant marines and were therefore official prisoners of war. But there was also ethnic reasons. German immigrants had been in Canada for decades and were more assimilated compared to other European immigrants. But there was probably more explicit racism towards people of a Ukrainian background than German during the war, simply because they were seen as being more different um, than, than the Germans were. Austrian internees were decidedly underclass and thought to be accustomed to hard labor. They were detained in rural centers, particularly in the Canadian Rockies, where they were forced to work on building and repairing roads bridges, rail lines, and national parks. They were often subject to harsh living and working conditions, including a lack of food and clean water, reduced pay, and the bitter cold. Many internees suffer more than just physical and social hardship, however. By the end of the war, internment operations had combined 106 internees to mental institutions. General Sir William Otter, Director of Internment Operations, remarked that insanity was by no means uncommon among the prisoners many being in turn to relieve municipalities of their care, while in others the disease possibly developed from a nervous condition brought about by the confinement and restrictions entailed. Long years of captivity mixed with harsh labor and living conditions were enough to shatter the nerves and undermine the psychological health of many internees. Hundreds of people suffered physically, socially, and mentally from their experiences in Canadian internment camps during the First World War. 
Their detainment and harsh treatment clearly found its roots in the blatant racism of the Canadian people and government at the time. According to historian Bodan S. Cordan, Canadian internment was designed to appease various local interests while meeting government needs. Most of those who were interned did not pose a genuine security threat to the nation. For much of Canadian society, however, the ethnic and cultural differences of the internees did pose a threat to their Anglo-Saxon Protestant vision of the new nation. As young Canadians lost their lives in the battlefields of Europe, many innocent immigrants lost their lives in concentration camps on Canadian soil. Both groups contributed to building Canadian nationhood. But the reality is that racism, that same racism that targeted those people for internment, also meant that many of their stories were then forgotten in the years after the First World War, which meant following up on what that trauma meant to them or what it did to their lives is, is very difficult now. There is a sense of irony in the fact that these internees, who were detained for being anti-Canadian, would be forced to work on projects which would help to build the nation and come to have great national importance. The forgotten narrative of Canada's dark past, far from the romanticized trenches of Europe, must be remembered too.